in the marshlands of central Florida. It's the Riley and Kimmy Show. A heavy, ominous stillness falls over the swamp. The Riley and Kimmy Show. And welcome to this episode 771 of the Riley and Kimmy Show. Right next to me is a person who just loves watching the Super Bowl. Kimmy! Hi, I am your host, Patrick Riley. Isn't he a gorgeous hunk of superhero? Oh, that's what Kimmy says all the time. You'll be able to find that out coming up uh, this upcoming uh, weekend on the way to Saturday. I'll be out and about with Kimmy. Uh, I'll be at Infinity Toy and Comic Con. We'll be there. And Kimmy is in the studio sniffing the cupcake uh, Captain America we got from Vicious Collectibles. Yes, it does smell like you could eat the thing, but you can't. I want to. No, you do not want to. Anyhow, we have a picture of that available right on our uh, Facebook page. Be sure to uh, like our page. And if you do like the Riley and Kimmy Show, be sure to share that with friends. Find a link to our Facebook page and other social media right on our website at RileyandKimmy.com. And if you follow, like us, friend us, all that stuff, we do the same right back with you. And I... I said that you loved watching the Super Bowl. Now, I know you watched you know, part of it. Um, we're just going to get a quick, and I mean a really short review here of Kimmy, and we're going to ask you one specific question about the Super Bowl. But I want to s- stress here, this will be Kimmy's review, not mine. I'm concerned you won't like her. She's different. Uh, in what way? In every way. Oh, that's so true. Now, here we go with that possible different review. My question, Kimmy, is because I know you really did not want to miss something. Tell me about the halftime performance of the Super Bowl. It sucked. Okay, that's Kimmy's brief review of the Super Bowl (laughs) halftime. Thank you, Kimmy. Uh, for for that now earlier we, we just mentioned a bit ago about a, a big toy convention happening there is one it's a toy and comic book conventions happening in orlando florida it's just days away it's happening saturday february 13th just before valentine's day and are we going to announce what you are giving away yet kimmy or is that maybe on the next episode or so i think we should probably start oh you're going to actually reveal on this episode 771 are, are you sure? You, or do you want to wait till 772? Now that's up to you. Nah. You want to do? Uh, you're, sure. Okay. On episode 771, Kimmy's going to reveal what she is giving away at our table at the Infinity Toy and Comic Con happening at the Holiday Inn out on Alafaya Trail in Orlando, Florida. Now I have no idea what Kimmy is giving away. I I don't know. She's been telling me it's a big surprise. So Kimmy. The question I have for you, what are you giving away at our table at Infinity Toy and Comic Con? Well, it's Valentine's weekend. Right. Kimmy's giving away free kisses. What? Kimmy's giving away free kisses. You are giving away free kisses to anyone Who comes up to the Riley and Kimmy show table. Yes. Do they have to ask for a kiss? No. Okay. So is it one kiss per person? Yes. Okay. So are you sure about this? Mm Mm-hmm. And I tell people you're shy. Okay. One kiss per person. Mm Mm-hmm. Come up to the Riley and Kimmy show table and get your kiss from Kimmy. Mm Mm-hmm. You're serious about this. Mm-hmm. You've thought this out. Mm-hmm. You're sure about this. Mm-hmm. You're you're all okay with this. Yes. All right. And it's just because it's Valentine's Day. Yep. All right. Didn't Lucy do something like that in Peanuts? I think. I don't know. Maybe I don't know. Well, Lucy? You, yeah, I, I don't remember. I in that psychiatrist thing she had that I don't think so. Oh, maybe maybe not. So okay, Kimmy. But if you want advice, Oh, is that five cents too? I think, you know, five cents. Yeah. And you'll donate that to, tr- to charity? The five yeah. cents? Oh, wow. That, so kind of you. All right, let's get this back. I'm going to back up here. Infinity Toy Comic Con, February 13th. Kimmy will be giving away a kiss per person. Just come right up to our table, right? Mm-hmm. A kiss per person. Okay. There, you heard it. You heard it first. I had no idea that's what she was talking about. That is. Kimmy's giveaway 
Wow. From the Riley and Kimmy show. Are you sure about this? Mm-hmm. You, you're supposed to be really shy. Okay. You not, jealous? No, well, no. No. You know, you're your own person. I don't control that, you know. Okay. If you want to give away a kiss to a person, you know, one, that is, okay. Okay. One kiss. Okay. I can handle that. All right? Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay, Kimmy, what's happening at the Infinity Toy and Comic Con besides you giving away a kiss per person? Well, there'll be free giveaways, raffles, costume contest, cash prizes, and this is all going to be happening February 13th from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. That's a Saturday, Saturday, the day before Valentine's Day, at the Holiday Inn on Alafaya Trail in Orlando, Florida. And it's only $8 admission to get in. Um, If you're 10 and under, it's free to get in. And if you go to UCF and you have a college ID, it's only $4 for admission. All right. And we have a link to Infinity Toy and Comic Con's website right on our website at RileyandKimmy.com. And it'll be really cool seeing an artist. uh, Let's see. Greg Lanz there, correct? And Mm -hmm. Austin Janowski. And by the way, speaking of... Artist Austin Janowski. He will be coming on the Riley and Kimmy show. He'll be on episode 772. We're going to be talking to Austin, hopefully, about the world of comic books. I've had discussions with him in the past. It's been some time. Uh, he has a, a good uh, knowledge of history in the world of comics. He, he, he doesn't just draw. He loves it. He really does. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. I, I want to talk about influences, too. What uh, influences Austin on some of those very beautiful designs that he has. And we're just going to talk about the future, maybe some projects that he has, and what he is bringing with him to the big Infinity Toy and Comic-Con. You do not want to miss our interview with Austin Janowski, coming up on episode 772 on the Riley and Kimmy show. Right, Kimmy? Mm-hmm. Now, Kimmy, are you ready to go back in time a little bit with some nerd trivia? Oh, yes. All right, Kimmy, here we go. Going back in time with some nerd trivia on this February 8th. All right. It was on this date in history, Kimmy, that MTV dropped the music television moniker from its logo. Give me the year. 98. It was 2010. Mm. They kept that around even though it you know, didn't really probably apply much anymore. It was on this date in history, Kimmy, that the White House began using radio. That's right. They began using radio to reach the masses. Can you give me the year and... Or the president, I'll give you that much of a leeway. FDR? No. Let's try the year. (laughs) Okay. um, 38? It was 1922. Any clue who the president would be in 1922? Mm -mm. I didn't think so. It was Harding. Okay. That was the president. And they were the first to use radio. So on this date in history, Kimmy, that the Dukes of Hazard ended its television run on a certain network. Give me the network and give me the year that it ended its run. ABC 78. It ended its run in 1985. Oh. Wrong network. Want to take a, another guess? NBC. CBS. Uh, which is it? CBS. It is CBS. That's correct. Can you tell me how many years that that show Seven. was on? It was on six and a half years. We'll give you that one. Okay. And something big about Dukes of Hazard. If you're a big fan of the Dukes of Hazard, some of the members of Dukes of Hazard will be nearby to Orlando, Florida. They'll be in Lakeland, Florida. Actually, uh, you know, almost in between Tampa and, and Orlando. Closer to Tampa, though. But uh, really cool location. Brand new one for Fanboy Expo. You'll be able to see, let's see, uh, both Duke Boys, the original Duke Boys, and also uh, Barbara Bach, mm-hmm. who played Daisy Duke. Is that right? Catherine Bach, right? That's right, Catherine Bach. Why did I say Barbara Bach? I don't know. Where'd that come from? I don't know. Well, thank you for that correction. Just making Daisy sure. Duke. Let's just I say that. I didn't even ask that. But Daisy you, Duke. You, how, did you ever watch that show? Nope. How'd you know it was Daisy Duke? I don't know. How, can you name another character on that show? Nope. Who was the like real bad guy? I have no idea. Boss Hog? Okay. Did, did you know there was a spinoff of the Dukes of Hazard? No, I didn't. You didn't know Enos was the spinoff? Mm-mm. Okay. You never watched a single one? Didn't it air right before Dallas, I think, on Friday nights, way back when? I I figured that might be one of your favorites. Okay, Kimmy, it was on this date in history. Kelly Clarkson won two Grammys. Give me the year. 
2010. 2006, she was the first American Idol participant to win a Grammy. I thought you would get that one right. Like, bang. Moving over to birthdays today. Lana Turner is having a birthday. She was born in 1921. Can you give me the year that she passed away? Do you know who Lana Turner was? Mm -hmm. All right, Lana Turner. What year did she pass away? 89. What year? 89. 1995. Audrey Meadows, born in 1924, passed away when? 78. 1996. And what is she really known for, the big role? Alice Cramden. On? The Honeymooners. Was she the original Alice or not? No. That's correct. She replaced the one who was Alice first because, well, the cover story was she was ill, had health problems, but the real reason was she was blacklisted. And they had to replace her, which is interesting because she was far older in looking. The the one who originally played Alice, grumpy and just and she was she was older in age. And Meadows applied for the role and was Jackie Gleason didn't want her. He said she was too attractive, so she frumped herself out and reapplied for the role without him realizing it's the same person. And she got the role. Hmm. So that's kind of a cool thing. And another cool bit of trivia with her is Meadows was the only member of the Honeymooners cast to earn residuals after the classic 39 episodes of the show ran from 1955 to 56 after they started uh, airing in reruns. She was the only one to get money because her brother, a lawyer, had inserted a clause into her original contract that she would be paid if the shows were rebroadcast. Thus, she made millions of dollars. Mm. Kind of a cool thing there. Mm -hmm. But that also means when you think about it, you know, Art Carney kind of got hosed. Hmm. A little bit. On this, okay, it was on this date in history. Jack Lemmon was uh, was born, 1925. Give me the year that he passed away, Kimmy. Hmm. 99. 2001. Another Jack born on this date. Jack Larson, born in 1928. What is Jack Larson known for? Jimmy Olsen. That's right, from the Adventures of Superman, and he passed away. What date? 2013. Passed away September 20th. 2015. Oh. James Dean having a birthday on this date in history. Born in 1931. James Dean passed away what year, Kimmy? Mm. 67. Actor James Dean. We're talking about the same person, correct? Uh Uh-huh. Actor James Dean passed away September 30th, 1955 at the age of 24. And he had three big films, but he did other films, but he had uncredited roles. Really more, he did a lot of television, Playhouse stuff, and and, and a lot of TV work. But can you name one of the three big films? I can name two. You can name two of the three. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm ready. Which which two? Rebel Without a Cause. Right. Giant. Yes. And? I don't know. East of Eden and Giant. He passed away before they actually had some of it finished, and his voice had to be dubbed Mm -hmm. by actor Nick Adams. Gary Coleman, born on this date, 1968, known for what TV show? Different Strokes. And passed away what year? Oh, 2012. He passed away uh, 2010 at the age of 42, and Kimmy had the honor of meeting Gary Coleman in Orlando, Florida. Remember that? Mm Mm-mm. Oh, yeah. I, that was out at the Orlando, let's see, not Orlando, the Orange County Fairgrounds. Yes. In a pig barn. Yes. I am not making <laughs> I'm not making that up. Yeah, she met, uh, let's see, you met him that day, um, Henry Winkler, sort of, and... Um, Eric Estrada. Yeah, I was trying to think of Eric's name. Eric Estrada. And, uh, and uh, Chewbacca was there, too. Mm-hmm. Peter Mayhew. Eating a pot pie. Well, he's hungry. It was a fun event. Mm-hmm. I'll never forget that one. I won't either. Oh, we'll talk about that some other time. On this uh, date in history, Mary Steenburgen was born, having a birthday. How old is she? Um, 69. She is 63. Can you name one of her two husbands? Ted Danson. That's the current husband. Can you name the one before that? Um, Jeff Goldblum. Actor Malcolm McDowell. Oh. All right, moving over to, I, 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 I'm not even going to ask you this one because I have a feeling I'm not, I'm not 
I just I don't think you know who this is. I think you know who it is, but you won't really know the embodiment of this individual's work. And it's not an insult to you at all. But this in ways, and some will argue with me, but some will understand, is the grandfather, maybe father, of steampunk. And that is Jules Verne was born on this date in history in 1828. You know who Jules Verne was, Kimmy? He was an author. That's correct. He passed away in March of 1905, March 24th of 1905, and he was a major influence and still is to this day. Matter of fact, his work, one of them is uh, Orson Welles' favorite of all time, and that is 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which Mr. Wells did perform at one time with Mercury Radio Theater. He loved Captain Nemo. What we're doing right now is going back in time a little bit to the golden age of radio. Radio was new. Radio, someone still loves you. And that's O'Reilly and Kimmy show as we go back in time here and we kind of, uh, you know, combine everything. A Jules Verne tribute with uh, something Orson Welles loves because, you know, the Riley and Kimmy show loves Orson Welles. And since he loved 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, I thought we would go to a radio adaptation of it, but not one of his. One that's a little bit different that we have never played a source of. We've never played anything uh, that this uh, dramatizations this group has done before. Uh, this was a series that was done on old time radio back in the 40s, and it's favorite story. Now, favorite story would highlight certain pieces of literature and dramatize it to radio. And they touched Jules Verne, and here is 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea going back to December 20th, 1947. Here is favorite story on the Riley and Kimmy Show. This is Ronald Coleman inviting you to radio's most dramatic half hour, Favorite Story. <laughs> a secret longing to go traveling across magic horizons? Our favorite story series transports you by the wonder of radio to mountain tops in Tibet, drawing rooms of Queen Victoria's London, and even to the moon. Well, this week we travel into the depths of the oceans of the world to bring you Jules Verne's most imaginative adventure, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. It was picked as the favorite story of the celebrated actor, director, producer, Mr. Orson Welles. Orson told us that he's always been a Jules Verne fan, and the mysterious Captain Nemo is one of his favorite characters. So here it is, for Orson and for all of you, the story which astonished the world in 1866, chosen by the man who, years later, astonished the state of New Jersey with his invasion from Mars. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, Act One. Mr. Arana, thank you for coming to my office. My pleasure, Commodore Farragut. I'm at your service. I know you're anxious to get back to Paris, monsieur, but believe me, this is a matter of extreme urgency. How can a botanist, a museum curator, be of help to you? We know of your reputation, Professor. Believe me, the nation, the world, has need of your knowledge. I'm honored. Before I go on, I must tell you that any word that passes between us now, from this second forward, must be kept in complete confidence. What I have to discuss with you is top secret. Shall I continue? You have my word, Commodore Farragut. Good. Professor, do you know about the steamship Moravian of the Montreal Ocean Company? Yes, that was the passenger ship which sank last March in the North Atlantic. I remember the papers were full of it at the time. You remember how the ship sank? I was under the impression that the Moravian had scraped on a submerged reef. We've conducted soundings all over that section of the Atlantic... Where the Moravian sank, the ocean depth is greater than a hundred fathoms. Astonishing. You know of the Scotia, which was stricken a few months later off the coast of England? 
The ship limped into dry dock at Liverpool. And there was a triangular gash in the hull of the Scotia which couldn't have been done more neatly with a metal punch. Professor Arana, the Scotia was rammed. But, Commodore, if this is true, it is an act of war. Uh, no vessels in the high seas are safe. True, Professor? True. What men would be capable of piracy in this day and age? Shall I tell you my theory? Please do. I do not believe that this is the work of a human being. What? I believe that these disasters are the work of some beast of the ocean depths. A giant whale, perhaps. Uncatalogued in your books of science. What is your plan, Commodore? Our Navy has just put into commission a new frigate. Named in honor of our late great president. Abraham Lincoln. Oh, yes. The ship is capable of a top speed of 18 nautical miles an hour. Incredible. 18 miles an hour. Commodore, this certainly is a miraculous age we're living in. We'll comb the oceans with this high-speed vessel. We'll find your sea monster, Professor, harpoon it, and make the shipping lane safe again. When do you sail? Friday at dawn. I'll be aboard, sir. It sounds like quite an adventure. Three months later, I was cursing myself for making such a hasty decision. For three long months, the Abraham Lincoln had seesawed back and forth across the Atlantic, doubled Cape Horn, and steamed into the peaceful seas of Japan. But there was no sign of the sea monster. The crew was restless. We slept fitfully. We never knew when the tusk of the great beast might rip into the hull of the Abraham Lincoln and send it to the bottom of the Pacific. I wouldn't worry about it, Professor. What's the matter in there? Don't you think the giant whale is going to favor us with an appearance? <laughs> if you ask me, I think this whole thing's a wild goose chase. With no wild goose. <laughs> <laughs> what makes you say that? All my life I've been chasing whales. I've been a harpooner on more voyages than I can remember. And I never yet in steamship. Ned, what would you say that is? Where? Off the starboard, the black object coming toward us. Lord, save us. I've never seen anything like it. Commodore, yes, we spotted it. Lieutenant, order the crew to battle station. Ned Land. Aye, aye, sir. Take your seats on the forecastle. We're depending on you to harpoon this creature. Aye, aye, sure, I'll do my best. Good man. Good Good man. 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 Whale, all right! What a water spout! Oh, she's Hold fast, men! That water's going to break over the ship! Hold fast! The whale spouted a torrent of water which broke over the frigate. I was thrown over the rail of the Abraham Lincoln and fell into the sea. Bobbed like a cork on the surface of an ocean two miles deep. By the time I could see and utter a cry, the Abraham Lincoln had swirled out of earshot. I knew that it would only be a matter of minutes before I was a dead man. There was no bit of wood to cling to, no shore to swim to. The nearest bit of earth was two miles away, straight down. I beat the water with my hands in a desperate effort to keep afloat until the last possible moment. Don't struggle so hard, Professor. Ned Land! So you were swept overboard, too. Thanks to that devil of a whale. Well, we can drown together, Ned. That won't be necessary, Professor. If you reach down, I think you'll find solid footing directly beneath you. Good Lord, Ned. This is a miracle. No, uh, no, sir. It's our whale. What? Let's keep your balance, sir. It's heating up out of the water. It has no scales. This isn't a fish, Ned. I'd say it's a regular ironclad. You're right. These are iron plates riveted together. This is a monstrous underwater vessel. Man-made. What will we do if it dives again? It won't. There must be men inside. Human beings with human sympathies. Beat on the shell with your knife, Ned. Aye, I will. We'll sir. have to raise such a racket that they let us in. Aye, aye, sir. Let us in. Let us in. Help us, you pirates. Save us. Let us in. Suddenly, one of the iron plates was lifted up. A man looked out, made a strange noise, and disappeared. A few moments later, 
Four strong men with masked faces appeared noiselessly and carried us down inside their formidable machine. Professor Arana. Yes, Ned. Is that you? Are you all right? These bruisers don't stand much on ceremony, do they? Dumping us down here where it's blacker than pitch. Well, we're completely at their mercy, Ned. Uh, I still have my way on knife. And if they have any ideas about rough treatment, I can make it interesting for them. Calm down, Ned. Let's not ask for trouble. Hey, listen. Someone's coming. With a light. There in the doorway stood the strangest man I've ever seen. He carried an electric lantern which cast sharp shadows on his face. It was a face which might have belonged to the Apostle Paul. A well-shaped forehead, wide-set eyes, a straight nose, a clearly cut mouth. His physique was magnificent. At his age, well, the man might have been 35 or 60. For at least a full minute, he stood in the doorway, examining us without a word. Well, why do you stand there just looking at us? If it's a fight, you want... Ned, control yourself. Sir, we don't know who you are or what you intend to do with us. My name is Pierre Arona. I am a professor of marine biology with the National Museum in Paris. This is Master Ned Land, Harpooner, United States Navy. We call upon your humanity to treat us as you would wish to be treated in a similar circumstance. He... he don't seem to understand. I'll try French. Monsieur, votre attention, s'il vous plaît. Je suis Pierre Arona, professeur de biologie avec le Musée National de Paris. Et voilà Monsieur Nedlin, Américain. Nous sommes vos amis. He still don't know what you're saying, professor. Well, I know a little German. Mein Herr, wir sind... Gentlemen, that will suffice. We will discuss these matters in whatever tongue you choose. I myself speak 13 languages. Then we'll talk in plain English. As you wish. Mr. Land, Monsieur Arana, I'm very annoyed to see you. An unkind fate has brought you here to trouble my existence. Unintentionally? Unintentionally? Was it unintentionally that your vessel pursued me halfway around the world? Was it unintentionally that Mr. Land hurled his harp at Papoon at my submarine? Gentlemen, you set sail with a single purpose of destroying me. Therefore, you dare deny that I have the right to treat you as enemies? Very well. Is there any reason, then, why I should show you hospitality? May I not place you outside of my deck and then sink beneath the waters and forget that you ever existed? Is that not my right? It might be the right of a savage, but not the right of a civilized man. I am not what you call a civilized man. I have done with society entirely. Therefore, I do not obey its laws. If you have it in mind to kill us, please make the death swift and merciful. I have no such intention. Professor Aronor, I have read several of your books on biology and deep sea life. Because of my admiration for your scientific knowledge and your learning, I've decided that you and your companion are to remain aboard this vessel. To whom are we indebted for this clemency? I am no one to you. That is just what you are to call me. Captain Nemo. We'll be captives, of course. On the contrary, Mr. Land. You will be my honored guests. You'll be free to move at will from stem to stern of my ship, which I call the Nautilus. I'll show you its wonders, its ingenious mechanisms, and answer your questions concerning the life we lead here. But, Captain Nemo, are you sure it is wise to take us into your confidence and show us the secrets of this amazing vessel? You have said we are your enemies. Aren't you afraid that we will take this knowledge back to our homes and use it to destroy you? That doesn't worry me in the slightest. Because I promise you, gentlemen, that neither of you will ever leave this vessel alive. Ready for Act Two of Orson Welles' favorite story, Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea, by Jules Verne. 
Professor Aronor and the harpooner, Ned Land, find themselves at the bottom of the ocean in one of the most remarkable vessels ever created, as guests of Captain Nemo. <laughs> Dined that evening with Captain Nemo, who was deliciously prepared. The men who served us, in fact, the whole crew of the Nautilus, maintained a strict silence whenever they were in our presence. Well, gentlemen, have you satisfied your hunger? I can honestly say, Captain Nemo, that I have never had a better meal in the finest hotels of Europe. Shall we go to the library? You have a library on board? 12,000 volumes. Unbelievable. But it'd be too much to expect for you to have anything for a man to smoke after dinner. On the contrary. Mr. Land, Monsieur Arnaud, may I offer you cigars? Huh? <laughs> I see, Captain. You haven't given up contact with Havana. I've given up all contact with your outside world. No, Professor. That which you mistake for Havana tobacco is actually a rare type of seaweed. Rich in nicotine. Dried. And rolled into cigars. Uh, we'll see how rare it is. This is the library. Captain, you have here some of the greatest treasures of the world. True. These bookshelves contain the gleanings of the richest minds that have lived on this planet. Your work's among them, sir. I am honored. And a grand piano. Do you play, sir? A little. Digest your dinners, my friends. I ask you to consider this question. Where do you think you are? Why, in the library of your vessel, of course. Floating on the Sea of Japan? No, Professor. Not floating. There's a half a mile of salt water above us, sir. We are beneath the Sea of Japan and traveling out of it at 30 knots an hour. Nonsense. I don't believe it. No? Master Land. Be so good as to slide that panel to your left. Yes. So, look. Behind the panel which Ned had opened lay a window of plate glass. In the faint light of deep underwater, I saw whole armies of fish swim by the Nautilus. Scores of fabulous creatures of the deep. They're attracted in such numbers by the lamps we steer by. But... Captain, where do you get your power to travel at such speeds? Electricity, sir. The sea supplies me with all the electricity I need through the chemical disintegration of seawater. One question. Ask it. A man must be wealthy to live such a life. Are you rich? Immensely rich. I could, without missing it, pay the national debt of France. <laughs> For many days after this, I did not see Captain Nemo. One morning upon arising, I found a note on the table of my stateroom. It was written in a bold, clear hand and was worded as follows. Captain Nemo invites Professor Arana to a hunting party which will take place this morning in the forests of Atlantis. Ned, we're going to visit a sunken civilization. That is correct. See, I don't know. As soon as you don this diving helmet, I shall be pleased to show you the ruins of Atlantis, the lost continent. Uh, shall I place this helmet over my head? I will secure the fastenings. We'll be able to talk with each other over telephone apparatus. And there's plenty of air to breathe. It's compressed in this little tank which you carry on your back. Here, Professor, let me help you. Oh, hey, this is a tight-fitting little cubby hole. Can you hear me, Professor? Oh, yes, yes, fine. Can you hear me, Captain Nemo? Perfectly. Now, if you'll follow me through this door, Professor... How deep is it here, Captain? Not deep. Only about 30 fathoms. You know, the ground upon which you are walking was many centuries ago dry land. Then there was an upheaval within the earth. This island sank beneath the waves of the Atlantic. That red glow ahead of us, what is it? It's lava, sir. We're climbing up the slope of an active volcano. The red glow grew brighter, and I found myself on the brink of an undersea volcano, with a crater pouring white-hot rock into the sea. There was a hail of volcanic debris descending in slow motion through the water. And at the foot of the mountain, before my very eyes, lay a town, ruined, destroyed, its roofs open to the watery sky, its temples fallen, its Grecian columns lying on the ground. 
In the blue-green distance, I saw the outlines of the necropolis, topped by the floating shadow of a Parthenon. Here was another Pompeii, a city which had died a double death, stricken by both fire and water. <laughs> It's a miracle. No, Monsieur Arnaud. It's a cataclysm. Shall we go back? As you wish. Oh, I had almost forgotten. I promised you a hunt. But how can we hunt, Captain? We have no weapons, no guns. Look to your left. Yes? What do you see? A sunken ship. Yes, a Spanish galleon. What do you suppose we'll find on board? I, I can imagine... Some of it seems to have spilled over the side. Here, yeah, Professor Arano. A solid ingot of pure gold. Kindly accept this trifle as a token of esteem from your friend, Captain Nemo. How much is this worth? In your world, perhaps a million francs. Down here, the fish place its value at exactly nothing. <laughs> A few days later, the Nautilus came to the surface to restore its supply of air. Our course was northward toward Denmark and the Scandinavian Peninsula. I was enjoying a quick stroll on deck. Abruptly, Ned Land grasped me by the arm. Look, sir, over there. Uh, what do you see, Ned? That thin gray line on the horizon. That's Europe. So it is. It's people, friends, relatives, home. Professor, we may never have the chance again. We must try to escape. Ned, he'll never let us get away. We know too much about him. And it's too far to swim. But this close to shore, there must be coastal steamers. Some vessel would pick us up. Look, there's a ship of some sort off our weather beam right now. Can you make out the flag she's flying? That's odd. The ship doesn't seem to be flying any flag. Gentlemen, what are you doing above decks? Well, Captain Nemo, you have granted us the freedom of the ship. I command you to go below. You can't command us. Sir, I ask you to address us as gentlemen, not as underlings. You have seen things which you should not see. For your own good, I tell you to go below. They're firing on us. Oh, the fools, idiots, they fire on me. As if their puny cannonballs could scratch the Nautilus. Ah, ship of an accursed nation! You know who I am. But I do not need your colors to know you by. Mr. Land, I don't know. Go below. Sir, are you going to attack this vessel? Sir, I'm going to sink it. You will not do that. I shall do it. And I advise you not to judge me, sir. The attack has begun. Go below. We went below. What else could we do? Through the heavy glass window of the library, I saw that we had submerged. Then a shock passed through the Nautilus. And the whole submarine shuddered with a frightful impact. Then through my window, I watched a dreadful sight. I saw a stricken vessel sinking below the waves. I saw men going down with her drowning before my eyes, their faces twisted with agony. There was tense breathing next to me. It was Captain Nemo. He looked out at the drowning men with an expression of utter hatred. Die. Die, you wretches. Die. Suddenly he seemed overcome by remorse. He ran to a desk, pulled out a drawer, took something from it. Then he fell to the floor, sobbing, clasping that something close to his breast. Forgive me. He stretched out his arms. He was holding a picture of a beautiful woman and two little children. Forgive me, my darlings. But now you are there. surface, Professor? Yes, and only a few hundred yards from shore. We've got to do it tonight. If we're ever going to get off this cursed vessel, we'll have to do it tonight. Everyone on board should be asleep by now. 
We'll have to cross the library in order to get on deck. I lead the way. All right. Hey, he's there. The captain, bend down. He may not see us in the shadows. Hurry and be quiet. Good evening, gentlemen. Isn't this a rather late hour to be wandering in the library? We may as well tell you the truth, Captain. We were attempting to escape. Well, for what other purpose do you suppose the Nautilus is floating so close to shore? I... I don't understand. You plan to escape. Am I hindering you? You... You... You let us leave the Nautilus? Perhaps the opposite is true. Perhaps the Nautilus is leaving you. What do you mean, Captain? A few miles to the north of us is a peculiar phenomenon called the Maelstrom. The Maelstrom? A whirlpool which draws ships into its vortex and smashes them in its whirling fury. Even now, gentlemen, our course is set for the dead center of the Maelstrom. You'll be destroyed. Naturally. Come with us. Save yourself. No, my friends. My mind is made up. I've lived long enough with bitterness. Everything must have an end, somewhere, some way. Go on, up the companionway. I will not hinder you. Save your lives if you like. Captain Nemo, I beg of you, come with us. Please, gentlemen, do not interrupt me. I must finish my composition. I hesitated a moment only, then hurried up the companionway to the deck. Ned Land and I dived into the icy water and swam easily to the shore where we found shelter in a fisherman's hut. Exhausted, I tried to sleep, but my mind kept traveling out to sea toward that whirlpool, that deadly vortex, the maelstrom. And all that night I dreamed of the Nautilus being sucked into its grave. And though I don't remember it, Ned Land says that I woke suddenly from my sleep, shouting at the top of my lungs, Goodbye! Goodbye, Captain Nemo. Sleep well at the bottom of your sea. bottom of your sea. You've been listening to Jules Verne's wild imagining, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. This novel clearly pictured and described the submarine many years before it became an actuality. And so this book has long been regarded as one of the most prophetic in all literature. Our thanks to Edmund MacDonald, who played Captain Nemo, to Jeff Corey, who played Professor Aronor, and to Messrs. Lawrence and Lee, who wrote and directed this radio dramatization. And our particular thanks to Mr. Orson Welles, who chose 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea as this week's favorite story. Next week, a brilliant and witty play, The Importance of Being Earnest. The last few years have seen a vogue of revivals of the comedies of Oscar Wilde. Audiences have found his wit as sharp as ever, and their laughter has filled New York and London theaters. His Importance of Being Earnest is the favorite story choice of the theater's most famous woman director, Miss Margaret Webster. We hope you'll be listening. Visit RileyandKimmy.com to connect on social media and for archive podcasts.